Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker Royal Ascot Day 2 Preview. I am your host, George Ellick, and I'm joined by two great minds who are going to give you plenty of winners ahead of Wednesday, I'm sure. We've got Daryl Carter, Odds Checker's newest tipster, giving you a daily nap on the app. You joined me last week to preview Tuesday. How's your weekend been, Daryl? Yeah, it's not been too bad. Laid out quite a hefty bet yesterday for the Odds Checker nap. Uh, Unfortunately, didn't get home. Uh, came fifth, so it was a disappointing day yesterday. But uh, no, it's been it's been okay overall since the start of racing. Um, looking forward to Royal Ascot, of course. We previewed the Tuesday uh, last week. Uh, looking forward to getting stuck into the rest of the week. Yeah, we are, this is being recorded on Monday at 10 a.m. So nearly, I guess Royal Ascot Eve, we can call it, can't we? Tomorrow it all gets underway. And joining us for his Odds Checker podcast debut is Ed Quigley as well. Long shot Ted on Twitter. I, I think. We need to demand you're going to give us a few long shots if that's going to be your name, Ed. Well, no, yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, hello, everybody. Yeah, um, absolutely. Gen- generally speaking, uh, I kind of sneer at the favourites. No, I mean, the, the favourites do win most races, but uh, no, no, I'm joking. Uh, I, I, that's the angle I'm going for here. Try and look for a bit of value. Sl- something slightly may have been a bit forgotten, a bit under the radar, uh, especially Royal Ascot through the years has, you know, gone hand in hand with a few upsets. So I'm not mm. quite talking the. Uh, 200 to 1 Kieran Fallon Jr. types, but um, <laughs> no, nonetheless, yeah, we're, we're looking for a bit of value throughout the week. And the, the, so, yeah, as always, Royal Ascot, it's a great occasion, some uh, some wonderful contests to look forward to. And you mentioned value, and it is all about value. So, before we get into the tips and your thoughts on the races, just want to point everybody listening or watching in the direction of the Odds Checker app. It's free to download and collates all the best bookie offers, the best tips, the best odds, and free bets too. It's the smartest way to bet for the shrewdest of punters who are after that bit of value. And also, of course, it is the only place you can read Daryl's daily naps as well. So I suggest you get on it. I mean, if you're listening to this or watching and you haven't got it now, I just download it as a companion just for this podcast or this video. Before we get into the day's racing on Wednesday, just to kind of introduce Daryl and Ed a little bit more. Can you just, starting with you, Ed, just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into racing why people should be listening to your thoughts on these races. I'm not sure about the final point there, uh, George, <laughs> but yeah, uh, essentially, I, um, I suppose I got into racing through my dad. I grew up not far from Cheltenham Racecourse, so uh, I think he's attended the last 47 Cheltenham festivals without wow. failure. So, um, yeah, that was kind of where I got into it, really. And I spent over a decade at the Racing Post, uh, to kind of summarise. And the last couple of years, though, I've been uh, freelance now for different Sky Sports uh, racing, Labrix television and various other things and an odds checker podcast so the most important one so yeah uh no really looking forward to it and as i say most people the long shot 10 name comes from my old long shot column in the racing post that's where that name and uh my twitter handle was set up nine ten years ago or whatever they went hand in hand at the time and i've seen as a few people uh, in pubs still address me as long shot rather than my name i thought well i've been called (laughs) far worse names than that in the past so we're we won't be changing the Twitter handle for now, put it that way. I'll stick the Odds Checker podcast at the top of that CV, yeah, Ed, because, yeah. uh, you know, it doesn't get better than this. And, uh, and Daryl, for, for those who, because you joined me uh, last week to preview Tuesday, if anyone's listening to this and didn't know that that even existed and Tuesday's racing hasn't happened yet, I would point you towards uh, our YouTube channel or the podcast channel in order to find that. It was just you and I chewing the fat for half an hour, wasn't it, Daryl? But for anyone who didn't hear that, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm a I'm a hospitality race day tipster. Uh, not long been in the game, so I'm working hard to try and make a name for myself. Uh, hospitality tipster at uh, Newmarket, Sandown, um, resident of Wincanton and at Cheltenham Racecourse. Uh, I've got a GG column uh, on gg.co.uk with daily selections. Of course, my uh, daily nap is exclusive to the Odds Checker app now. So, um, yeah, just really excited, just trying to work hard. Trying to get my head down. Hopefully, uh, one day I'll have a prestigious CV such as, uh, such as <laughs> Ed over there, hopefully. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Given you've already got a checker on it, Darren, I thought you thought you've already made it. But, uh, but, but we'll let that one go. We'll let that one go so long as you can give us the winner of the first on Wednesday. This is Wednesday's preview, day two of Royal Ascot. Hopefully, we're going into it with our pockets full after a good Tuesday. And I'm going to quickly run through the market for the Silver Royal Hunt Cup, the Hunt Cup, big handicap to open the day on Wednesday. Uzo is the 7-1 to one favourite. It was done at 101 last weekend uh, when, when it went early, clear under Ryan Moore and was collared late on. 7-1 Uzo. Uh, May Danny, 8-1. to one. Presidential, 10-1. to one. 
Salayel 12 to 1, Nick Klaus 12 to 1, Sabuska 12 to 1, 14 to 1 bar. Plenty in there. Always tough to land one of these ask at handicaps. But if you can bang in a winner in the first, it normally puts you in pretty good stead for the rest of the day, let alone the rest of the week. Daryl, as the the veteran of this podcast, I'll come to you first. Uh, where where are you looking in the first on Wednesday? Uh, I, I, first of all, I think the market has got this pretty spot on with the, with the top two in the market, Uzo and May Danny. I do, however, think that May Danny is going to be the best horse in this race going forward. He's completely unexposed. He was a ready winner off a mark of 80 on return. Um, he's got, been given a £10 rise for that, but he's going to keep on progressing. Um, he's a very strong stayer, so the stiff mile should certainly suit at Ascot. Uh, the only concern with him, and I do think he's going to be the best horse in the race going forward, he is beautifully bred um, to be much better than a mark of 90. The only concern is going to be the draw. Now, the last few years in the Royal Hunt Cup and Big Field Handicaps is paid to be drawn high. Um, Uzo, the favourite, is drawn in 24. May Danny is drawn in five. Now, there is pace down low. Um, if Brian Epstein comes in here, he's drawn in stall, at, stall late. He was a nap for Tuesday, but uh, it looks like he's second reserve there. So he might come in here over the mile. He is a pace angle in here. Um, so that might help, help May Danny. But the draw would be a slight concern. But I have no doubt that this horse is it's going to be rated much higher than 90 um, in the very near future. So I'd be hoping class overcomes the draw here with May Danny around eight to one. So eight to one, May Danny, as short as 13 to two with uni back. That eight to one is with Bet365, Labrooks, and plenty of others on the Odds Checker grids and on the Odds Checker app. Ed, what are your thoughts? Uh, splinters in my backside in the opener, I've got to be honest. I, 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 do, I do the general sentiment on May Danny, the unexposed type, if you like, off a mark of 90, surely will progress beyond that. Does have the lack of experience, which could count against him, but I, I tend to side on the those that are ahead of the handicapper, uh, even if they are light on experience. The draw, I mean, we're discussing this off, off air. I mean, amount of times sitting in the racing post having debates about the draw bias and then after two races everyone's ripping it up and you know everyone thought oh you want to be drawn here but you'd be better off in the car park and I, I take Daryl's point entirely that the pace and the draw angle it's, it's always an unknown so I tend to shelf the uh, the draw bias as in terms of a list of things I'm looking to try and try and quantify if you like and so he could, I don't know whether high or low is going to be good is, is the bottom line in my opinion but Zui Feng won the Royal Hunt Cup back in 2017, off a mark of 100, Amanda Perrett's veteran. Now, look, this horse is started to show, perhaps, that the fires don't quite burn like they used to. However, gets in here off a mark of 94. So he's six pounds lower than winning the Royal Hunt Cup, at, obviously, back in 2017. There's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. But then you're getting the price of, what, 20, 25 for one around that kind of mark. I've got to be honest with you, these types of races, I do take a bit of a pinch of salt. But... um. I think May Danny is the most exciting, most progressive of the protagonists would be the one I would side with. But Zui Feng, as I said, only course a distance winner in the lineup, won the Royal Hunt Cup off six pound higher mark going back three years ago. So clearly you think this has been the target for some time. And from a draw of 22 or 24, I said it could be the car park draw. It could be the Golden Highway. Uh, we'll probably know a lot more, obviously, after we've seen some of the action on Tuesday. But um, yeah, that would be my tentative each way play for Amanda Parrott around the uh, 20 to 1 mark. Long shot by name, and he doesn't disappoint with a 25 to 1 shot in the first. But as you say, nothing particularly strong there. Just take a race with a bit of a pinch of salt, and also don't get too caught up in the draw and analysing the draw, I guess, is that the main tips here. But Jury Feng there, Fred, at 25 to 1 is with Bet365. But May Danny out of the Johnnies catching both of our experts' eye there at 8 to 1. Let's move on now to the Hamden Court stakes where Juan. Elcano is the 5-2 to two favourite, just ahead of first receiver. A lot of firms have them as joint favourites. Uh, Russian Emperor, 7-2. to two. Berlin Tango, 6-1. to 14-1 to one bar. We'll mix up the order here and come to you first, Ed. Um, you know, four horses basically at the top end of the market, and then you've got double figures below. Where do you think the value lies at the moment? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, there is an argument. It's with the favourite. <laughs> In yeah. the sense, so Juan Ocano's official rating is 110. The, the form from last time behind the Cameco is pretty smart, isn't it? I mean, for example, first receivers would be getting £12 from him in, in a handicap. And as I reckon with the, the Frankie, Sir Michael Stout, Royal Ascot factors, a chance here this horse could go off favourite, I think, to be honest with you. So 
It's a tricky one. I do think 10 furlongs will suit uh, the, the Kevin Ryan horse as well. Stayed on quite nicely in the guineas, I thought. But I'll let Daryl take this one because uh, I'm not having a bet in the race. I think it's quite wide open in, in all truth. And uh, yeah, I'm happily sitting this one out. Very good. As we always say on the Odds Checker podcast, if our experts don't have a selection, they will say so. No point tipping up something they wouldn't bat themselves. Daryl, no pressure. I've got quite a strong fancy in this race, actually. Yes. And just, uh, despite the four-pound penalty, I think Berlin Tango is the horse to be with. I think he represents great value at around six to one. He's a Group 3 winner already uh, with that Derby trial success at Kempton. I really like the way he went through that race that day. Travelled powerfully and he changed. He, he cleared away from the field and then changed his legs again at the finish. He's going to be a strong stayer. His previous runs also suggested that the step-up and trip was definitely going to bring out some improvement with him. He's the only guaranteed stayer in this field, if you like, and you're getting six to one about this horse. I think he could be pretty smart. Um, I, I think that Kempton run, despite the four-pound penalty, you know, I think he's going to improve again for this trip. I really like him. I think he's quite exciting. I think he's quite exciting horse. So uh, Berlin Tango for me, even under a four-pound penalty here. One Aqua, one Aquano. I can see, I can see the angle there. The Guineas does normally work out really well um, every single year, despite how weak people think it might be each each and every year. It tends to work out very well. So I can see the the angle on the favourite. He is open to improvement. It just doesn't scream to me like he wants a real test. And I think they will go quite hardy. I think New World Tapestry is in here to set this up for Russian Empire to make this a strong test. So I think a lot a lot is in Berlin Tango's favour, especially as he's race fit. I, I really like him under Archie Murphy. Yeah, fair to say. Even if it's a weak guineas, you're hardly going to get their trainers sending their, uh, you know, <laughs> they're going to be sending their smartest horses there, aren't they, anyway? So yeah. you can't really knock the form. Um, six to one Berlin Tango is with Bet365, Betfair, Bet Victor, and Paddy Power. What would be your... It's one of those prices, I guess, that people who, who aren't regular punters, aren't regular followers of yours, might be wondering if they should back it each way or, or, or back it with only. Looking at the shape of the race, the price of the horse, what would be your, your advice there? I think, I mean, it depends what type of punter you are. I'll, I'll be backing him each way. I can't have him out of the, out of the three, eight runner field, three, three places. I can't have him out of the three. It's six to one. You're going to make a little bit of money on an each way place if he, if he gets nabbed by something. But I... I genuinely think he is the the best horse in this race. He's a he's guaranteed to get the trip. There's so much more to come from him. I mean, it's entirely it's entirely up to the part. I'll be backing him each way, <laughs> you know, just in case. But uh, and then you'll be a little bit on six. And then he'll be crying into your slip at one forty eight when one of them comes out at the start and it cut, and finishes <laughs> and finishes third. <laughs> We've all been uh, there. We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> seems to happen. It seems to happen every week. Um, right then. Uh, the third race of the day is the King George at 2.25 on Wednesday. Uh, Kipps is the current favourite at 13-2, to 2, but it is very, very tight at the top end of the market. Win o'clock, 7-1. Bright Melody, 8-1. to one. Bodyline, 9-1. to one. Uh, To Nathaniel, 9-1. to one. Convict, 10-1. to 14-1 to one bar. I mean, it is a trappy enough market at the top end there. And I'm sure we'll see plenty of movement between now and, the, and when the race is off. And I guess... Our job now, looking at this 48 hours before the race, is to work out which way that market's going to go. Daryl, do you have any views? Um, I do. I'm going to follow the Berlin Tango formula from Kempton and, and back Bright Melody here off a, off a mark of 98 first time cheek pieces. Um, I think is a great move. Uh, you notice that he was just having a little look around, coming around a bend at Kempton and then stayed on strongly. The step up and trip is a reason for improvement. Um, lofty mark, 98, but I, I think this is better than a handicapper going forward for Charlie Appleby. Uh, so I'm going to follow the form line for Berlin Tango in these two races. If Berlin Tango goes and wins in the 150, I can see this bright melody going off quite a lot shorter than 8-1 to one, uh, in the 225. So I'm going to stick with there. Nothing in here really screams as thrown in off their mark um, for me personally. So I'm going to go for the, for the class act in the field. Towards the end of the market again, but bright melody, 8-1. to one. Now, they're not going to, like me saying this, I would have thought our bookmaker partners, but you've got six to one uh, Betfair Paddy Power uh, around about for Berlin Tango. And the same firms are eight to one Bright Melody. I must say, I smell a bit of an each way double leg. Make sure you get your money tied up into that form line before the first race goes. And as you say, if Berlin Tango goes in, you're going to be on a city on a lovely little double there going into Bright Melody following uh, the thinking there of Daryl. Uh, Ed, what are you liking here? 
Yeah, one of my strongest fancies, well, I, I won't lie, my strongest fancy of the day actually comes in this race. A uh, horse for Owen Burroughs in here called Hyaku, I believe is the pronunciation. And anyone who saw this horse run last time out at Kempton came from an absolutely different postcode to win this contest. I think he was about seventh uh, as they came inside the final two furlongs. A couple of taps of the whip. He's, a hu- he's almost looks like an old-fashioned chaser. I mean, he's a huge, big, galloping, strapping thing. And I don't think... Uh, Kempton really suited him all that well. I mean, he was outpaced in green on his debut at Newbury over seven when finishing third. It was really interesting listening to Owen Burroughs about this. He was entered in the Hampton Court uh, the race before on the car. They consider going the 10 furlong group uh, group race. They're stepping him up from a mile to mile and a half on his handicap debut. And he's just got so much stamina in his pedigree. Obviously, his side will see the stars. He won a derby. But his damn from a stout middle distance uh, staying background. So, I find it really intriguing. They're jumping from a mile to mile and a half handicap debut. And as I say, anyone who saw that running Kempton last time out, I mean, you thought he was going to drop out the back of the television and you could hear John Hunt's commentary was almost, well, wow, where's this come from? I just think this trip's tailor-made for him. They clearly had a lot of options with this horse, where they were going to go. I think he was entered in a new market as well. They've clearly thought a lot, a lot long and hard about this. And Jim Crowley in the saddle, as I said, visual perspective gives the impression he'll prove a bundle uh, for this distance and the pedigree was just so as well. Uh, I take Daryl's point uh, slightly that perhaps on what he's actually achieved so far, a mark of 90 doesn't make sense. Go, oh, wow, he's thrown in. But I put it this way, I'd be very disappointed if for that extra half a mile, he couldn't improve a lot. Uh, it would be my point of view. So, yeah, he, I, up to you again, whether you want, you're an each way player or you're on the nose, however you want to play it. But I would be very disappointed uh, you know, check your, your each way concessions if you like. If he wasn't in the frame here, I would be very disappointed because I also the final point I think Ascot would really suit him as well. As I said, if you look at the size of this horse in the paddock, he's a really strong, big galloping type. He he just wants a nice kind of stiff track to, as they turn into Ascot, you can kind of wind him up and away he goes. And um, yeah, if you haven't seen the race, even if you don't want to back you can just watch his last race because I remember watching it at the time thinking, well, this is just rubbish. Um, (laughs) And he absolutely picked up um, like a train. So, yeah, Hukum, for me, uh, one of my strongest fancies on the Wednesday. You had me a handicap debut, Ed, I must say. Uh, 14 to 1, Bet365, Labrooks, a few other firms as well. And also uh, a few firms paying paying five places currently as well. So make sure you look at the top end of the grids or on the app to see who's paying paying the extra places. Ed, you talk about Owen Burrows there, who... um, you know, is a trainer who's been around for what four or five years now. Um, has you know trains a lot of horses in these silks. You know, powerful owners. It's fair to say, yet to get um, his first uh, Royal Ascot winner. When looking at, at, at backing horses for Royal Ascot, do you take into account the trainer's history with the festival? I mean, it could go both ways. Firstly, there's no denying he's going to be absolutely desperate to get a winner in the coming week. But on the other hand. You know, you've got these trainers who, you know, more powerful trainers maybe who year in, year out come away from Ascot with, with winners under their belt. Uh, not something that I would, I would be law abiding on that, put it that way. Naturally, uh, you, you're John Goldston, you're Sir Michael Stouts, they're going to churn out their winners, aren't they? And yeah. the, mar- the market often re- reflects that. No, uh, no, he hasn't had that many runners at the meeting. And as you say, it's in a way when you've got a, perhaps a smaller string and you're desperate to get that first winning, you perhaps are more selective of where you aim the horse. And you, mm. if you think you've got a real gem, you're not just going to just throw it in any old kind of group three or two and, oh, well, there's another day for it type kind of attitude. Uh, uh, just with Hugh it feels like that kind of idea with, uh, actually, the quote from Owen Burroughs is he's considering he hopes he'd be his derby horse this year. That was what he said back at the start. So obviously if he can't, uh, bolt up off a mark of 90 here. He's nowhere near that. But in what is a, a funny year, um, you know, the, the, there's funny kind of tactics going on. And I, I'm just convinced he will be better than this mark over this trip. And no, in answer to your question, I'm not too worried necessarily about lack of win or whether you had 100 winners. If you've got the horse, Owen Burroughs is clearly a very good trainer. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's not a point that I'm, I labour over too much. Absolutely. And he's been in decent form since racing returned as well. So good uh, yeah, good good write up there from both Owen Burrows and from Ed for Hookham. 14 to 1 best price. Uh, that is for the King George. On to now the three o'clock, the Prince of Wales, the Group One. Japan is just about still the even money favourite. 10 to 11 across the board, but Betway sticking out there next at even money. Headman 
five to one, Barney Roy, six to one, ten to one. Bar, I'll run through them all because it's a group one and because there aren't very many runners. Uh, Adayeb is ten to one, uh, Medayi is twelve to one, Lord North, twelve to one, Bangkok, forty to one. Seven runners here, so sadly, no, no odds on favorite eight runners for the punters. Um, but Daryl, start you know, we, when we spoke on Friday about Tuesday, you were very keen to take on most of the Aidan O'Brien favourites at the top of the market. Is it the same story here? It, it is the same story here, yeah. Um, look, Japan desperately needed the run last year. There was an interview with Kevin Blake again. We said about Circus Maximus for the Tuesday preview, uh, but he said about Japan, he said they're going to step up and trip later on in the season. It will benefit for the run. Um, and I think this is a trip short of his best. There's also no pacemaker in here. And there is so little pace in this race. Um, you wonder where it's going to come from. And Japan is going to need a real strong gallop if he's fit and ready to go over this trip short of his best. And even money, I think you can leave him alone, really. It's just what are you going to take him on with? Hedman, for me, is definitely going to improve from three to four. I really like him. I'm a big fan of him. But is he going to be ready first time out after a long layoff? You know, a big horse like that, is he going to need the run? It's very difficult to find something to take him on with. Although I am going to try my best. I haven't found anything <laughs> yet. But I think the favourite is avoidable here, especially at the price. Maybe at the moment, just, just lay, lay the jolly. Is that Would that be your... It, it, at the minute, that's where I'm sitting with it. Yeah, because the looks, the Adi Eb is, I'm a big fan of Adi Eb as well, but the quicker the ground gets, the, the less chance Adi Eb has in this race. Barney Roy's interesting over this trip. Lord North couldn't have it uh, for, for any money. I think he's got an inflated mark. Medier, lovely turn of foot. Will Frankie make the running on Medier again? Perhaps there is, it, the options are very limited, I feel. I don't know how Ed feels mm. about it, but it's a tricky, tricky race. Let's find out. Ed, what do you reckon? <clears throat> no, I'd echo a lot of what Daryl's saying there, actually. Uh, I, I'm against Japan. I've, again, I think trip too short. And I know the horse won the Judmont, but was all he was he was at peak fitness when he beat Crystal Ocean that day. And he was all out, you know, I think a mile and a half is his trip. Few of Aiden, I'm, I find it hard to weigh up. Lot, traditionally, a lot of Aiden O'Brien's come on for the run, don't they? Mm. As is enforced this year, he's having to run them first time out, if you like, in the, what is their target. And we've seen a few of his just run, like in the Gallinule Stakes, mythical. I mean, ran no sort of race at all. We, we've seen a few others just run flat. And then also we've seen loads bolt up. So I, I'm i not quite sure where I'm at with uh, the Aiden O'Brien camp in general. But Japan, ignoring all that, just a mile and a half from Shaw's his trip. And all the vibes are, he, he will strip a lot fitter for this outing. I just think the end of the season is his time. And I, I would take him on with Hedman. I would go with Hedman. I perhaps may need the run, but... I just really think this horse will progress, uh, you know, as he gets gets older. And I also think that the ground is something we haven't actually touched upon much here. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, when the word soft's in the going, uh, I think that helps him put it that way. He doesn't need an absolute deluge. I mean, when he won at Deauville in that group two, I mean, it was kind of winter jumping ground, wasn't it? But uh, just a bit of cut in the ground will suit him. That's pretty much what Roger Charlton's always said. And I, there's, you know, a little bit, a few showers around during the week. It's not going to be riding quick at Royal Ascot if the weather forecasts hold up accurate, uh, you know. So I think that will suit him. I just think there's lots to like about him. In the Irish champion, you put a line through that run, you read up at the start coming out of the schools. Graham was probably quick enough anyway. And to his credit, I thought he showed good heart to finish fifth on that occasion. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah, again, it's a race where I'm not blown away by Japan as an even money favourite. It's... What beats it? Barney Roy is probably the joker in the pack here because obviously mm. this horse went off the stud, fired blanks, came back. He won. He won a group. He, 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 he won. Well, that, that was the official line from Richard Hannon. I can just quote him what he said on his website. Um, but Barney Roy won a Group One in Maidan last time out. But come on, I mean, it's a Group One in name only. I mean, he beat 111 yeah. rated rival. I think half the field rated in the 90s. I mean, it was a it was a glorified Group Three. But he is the kind of horse, you know, he's got previous good course form and he clearly arrives here in good form uh, coming back from Maidan. But he's a little bit of the unknown quantity in here and official ratings suggest he's not that far behind him. So, yeah, in general, I'm against Japan. I think Hedman will be geared up for this. So I think ground will be perfect and I think he'll be a really nice um, older horse for Jim Farms this year. And yeah, Hedman will be my selection. Would you, Hed would you, sorry, George, <clears throat> would you, you worry about, about the pace for him? Ed, with well, the lack I, of pace in the race. Yeah, you say lack of pace. I, I personally think Frankie will just go 
and it, it'd be a case of when that pace collapses, if you like. Uh, and it's, it's how far Frankie can tow them along. Um, obviously, James Doyle's on Lord North for, for the Gosden outfit, and I think he'll want a good tow into the race. Uh, it generally is a concern, and it is slightly surprising that Bally Doyle haven't set in one or nine pacemakers, which tends to <laughs> tends to be the case, doesn't it? But um, yeah, uh, I, look, it's a bit of a head scratcher. My bottom line would be I'm against Japan. Uh, the, the horse, I think, would be most likely to cash in if Japan blows out, would be Hedman, that'd be my view. So Hedman getting a tentative, um, yeah, just the one to maybe take Japan on, but nothing concrete from either of the guys, except for maybe just looking at Japan and thinking that 10 to 11 even money is not a price you should be getting involved at. Daryl, we keep letting down the favourite backers listening to this podcast. They're absolutely desperate <laughs> to hear us finally say there's an Aidan O'Brien good thing coming up. Maybe we'll get there by uh, by Saturday. Um, but we'll move on now to the Royal Hunt Cup, uh, where Lord Tennyson is the 8-1 to one favourite. Uh, Bell Rock, 10-1 to one alongside Al Raja. Uh, Montatham is 12-1. Uh, to one. Fox Premier, 14-1 to one alongside Kesa. Kindren, Raising Sand, 16-1 to one bar. The rest, long shot, Ted. Only, only one horse in the race, not double figure price. Yeah, it's absolutely uh, it's carnage, isn't it? But um, yeah, it's it's a tricky old one. I, I I haven't had a bet in the race. I don't know if I will. Uh, but the one that's on my shortlist, I'm um, basically keep a weather watch. Is is my angle here again for the half showers forecast for Wednesday? And we we all know don't know what showers means. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so raising sand is obviously a horse. You know, who's kind of been there and done it to some extent for Jamie Osborne, Nicola Curry. Downside would be a mark of 108. Uh, we'll have to run out of its skins, win off that, defy that type of rating. However, this horse just absolutely loves the venue. It's won seven times in its whole career, the eight-year-old. Four of them have come at Ascot. The horse, for whatever reason, uh, just comes alive as soon as it comes back to this venue. And also, the best of its form has come with substantial give underfoot. So that would be my kind of angle in here because I could see a little bit of a... I wouldn't say a gamble as such in a race such as this, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if Raising Sands price contracted if the heavens really did open in the morning. Because this is Jamie Osborne. This has been the target. They umdenard over a prep run or whatever. No, straight here, first time out. And uh, as I said, this is a horse who's got phenomenal course form. Four wins at the track, all pretty much on soft ground. Ticks a lot of the boxes from that perspective. Obviously, a mark of 108. Uh, the horse is more exposed than others, which hence pretty much why Raising Sand is the price it is. But uh, bottom line is, no bet yet, but I'm keeping a close eye um, in Michael Fish style on the weather to see, <laughs> see what happens here. Because if the heavens really do open, I think the handicap perspective and the actual marks, to some extent, will go out the window with this and it'll just be a case of who handles conditions. Raising Sand, 14 to 1 with bet 365. Sky bet currently paying seven, paying seven places at the moment, 12 to 1. Uh, with Sky, but I've just had a look at the forecast as it stands, and yeah, can't help me much. Showers on Tuesday, showers on Wednesday, but it looks like the showers might be coming later on Wednesday, so it might the rain might come a little bit too late for raising sand. But keep your eye out. Sadly, it's the only thing that you can't find on the other checker app is, is the <laughs> weather, uh, but you can find the going, of course, uh, for every day as we find out what is going on. Uh, Daryl, what are you liking in the in the Royal Hunt Cup? Uh, I had a I had a similar thought thought to Ed about uh, a fact in this um, three pound high. We went in it last year, but Kieran Fallon negotiates that claim. Mm -hmm. Clearly been laid out for the race. Coming here fresh, loves the course. Drawn uh, his last two brilliant runs uh, at the Ascot Straight Bar. He's drawn high both times. He's drawn in eighteen again. Like we said, we don't know what's going to happen with the draw yet, but that could be a positive for him. He's sixteen to one shot. Um, uh, it's it's boring and it and it's. But I think towards the top of the market is where we got. I think Bell Rock has got plenty more to come. I think they can think quite a bit of this Bell Rock. Uh, and the way he got up on the line to, to tonight, Uzo, um, in the in the dying stages at Newmarket, just suggests he's got so much more to come. And they had, they've had a similar horse, Dukes of Hazard, who improved towards the back end of last season. Um, so Bell Rock could, could be one of those. He looks like he's got more to come. Mark 103. Yeah, I mean... He could be a group horse. You're not sure. Same with Lord Tennyson. I thought he ran a blinder at Newmarket and behind Marie's Diamond in a listed, in listed company, running it back in a handicap. I could see him being a gamble on the day at eight to one. I think the right horses, the unexposed horses, are towards the top of the market. So 
you are trying to look for a raising sands or in a fact perhaps something that could upset the apple cart but i think if i'm going to be pushed for a bet at the moment like i say we're keeping an eye on the weather i'd probably stick with bell rock at 10 to 1 nothing wrong with a 10 to 1 winner darren i don't think that's too boring at all I think we can we can handle that. But it's it's Andy Holding, our, our usual tipster, who sadly couldn't join us today. He always says in a race like this, you're just looking for a group horse running in a handicap. And you, you kind of touched on that there. That there could be more to come from these couple of horses at the top end of the market, Lord Tennyson yeah. and Bell Rock. So uh, interesting to see there. But a fact, as you say, is uh, 16 to 1. As short as 11 to 1 elsewhere, but 16 to 1 with a few firms, including Labrooks, Hills, Bet Victor, Coral, Bet Fred and Genting Bet. Uh, happy to move on. Anything more to add on the uh, Royal Hunt Cup? We'll move happy on. To yeah. And to now the Windsor Castle. And we have Sun- Sunshine City. Very, very tough horse. Uh, so very tough name to say that one on a podcast. Wouldn't, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't, want, to, wouldn't want to say it on live TV, I must say. <laughs> but Sunshine City is five to one. Uh, Chief Little Hawk, six to one. Sheriff Bianco, eight to one. Uh, Mighty Gurkha and Tactical, both 10 to 1. Uh, yeah, 12 to 1 bar. Daryl, come come to you for the Windsor Castle. I've got to be honest with you. I, I find it very difficult to get an angle into these two-year-old races. Um, some of these horses can take massive step forwards from one run to another. They can also take massive step backwards, um, especially with a Wesley Ward running in there, a bit of an unknown. Um, I wouldn't have a strong opinion in here. I thought tactical was quite impressive. Um, not getting the splits behind Eye of Heaven. I know how much the stable Mark Johnson fancy Eye of Heaven later on in the week. You'd think tactical would have a bit more to come. Uh, it, look, this is completely the opposite of a betting race for me, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> it's the type of thing I'll try to avoid. There is so much uncertainty in here. Um, so this, I haven't got this is, when you, this is when you go and go make yourself a sandwich, is it? I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, uh, Eddie, can you add any more to that, or are you are you opening the mayo as well? Yes, it's, it's a glorified gas up, isn't it? But it's like, there's some precocious types in here. It's really interesting. The, the two, funny enough, I shortlisted were tactical. Who did not get the rubber the green last time mm-hmm. out. And I think probably will be better than what showed there. But the one horse in there was for you know, obviously the Archie Watson Holly Doyle team. Are absolutely flying, aren't they? That rapport yeah. is wonderful. I think they're operating around a 31% strike rate since I'm the really. uh, lockdown came back. And they've got the mighty Gurkha in here, who won an egg and spoon race. I mean, it was a rubbish contest at Lingfield, but absolutely annihilated the field in what was a pretty decent time. It was just one of those races where if you've seen something run, it's caught your eye. It's what made an impression on you, really, because, uh, as I say, that there's a lot of guesswork here. Wesley Ward's got one in here with Frankie on. I actually envisage that will go off a lot shorter as is with the kind of the a lot of the, the Frankie factor at Royal House Scotland, given that Wesley Ward's record of sprinters, if you like. But uh, it's not a race I'm having a bet in. But if Mighty Gurkha does go to a big price, I may, I may consider getting involved. Yeah, Mighty Gurkha went off 8-15 to 15 on debut uh, 10 days ago. And yeah, won by seven lengths, I think it was. Seven and a half lengths at Wolverhampton. So, no, sorry, at Lingfield. So certainly eye-catching that one. If you haven't seen it, I would... Definitely worth watching. Short six to one elsewhere with Paddy Power and Betfair. So they clearly agree with Ed. And Tactical, you gave a mention to, found absolutely no luck in running uh, last time and is 10 to one with Labrooks and Bet Victor. But largely a watching brief this one. But it is a great, you know, as you say, a, a, just an absolute speed fest, really. So always worth watching, especially with the Wesley Ward horse at the top of the market. Uh, we've got to the final race of day two, uh, the Copper Horse Handicap where Fajaria Prince is the 5-1 to one favourite ahead of Collided 11-2, to two. hereby 9-1 to one with Ranch Hand, 11-1 uh, All Right Sunshine, Salino 12-1 to one with Almania, 14-1 uh, to one bar. Last race of day two, the lucky last. Hopefully we've already given one or two winners. What are we going to back in the last? Ed, I'll come to you. Yeah, I'm going to go with Collide. <clears throat> I'm sticking with uh, the, the trip angle is one of my, my kind of favourite angles in, if you like, in regards to trying to find a bet and all last year uh sound like a glorious aftertimer here but i, I was <laughs> i was just run this horse over mile six i, was, I mean that's that's how exciting my life gets but uh no i, I just i just think uh last year he ran in the duke of edinburgh over a mile and a half at this meeting was staying on in all the time in the closing stages i think it was beating about three lengths in the end over a mile and a half that day couldn't quite get there 
obviously the, the negative is that was off 99 in theory with the penalty here. I think it's what 106. Uh, so there's more to do from that point of view. But this is the horse's trip. Ran over mile six at Chelmsford last month. One in, in pretty cosy style, it has to be said. Ryan Moore's in the saddle. Hugo Palmer team are going along OK. And I just think this is all about trip. He is unexposed over this distance. I almost feel, I wouldn't say he's wasted his career over shorter, but they perhaps went a little bit too on too long over shorter distances with him. In time, I see him being a proper stay. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he was up to the two mile plus contest, contest by the end of the end of the campaign. I think Ryan Moore on, yeah, I know he's got a lot of weight here, but he's on a hat trick. I think the trip is the key. It, it's one of those that if he was running over a mile and a half, I would not entertain him in my shortlist of four or five for this, this race. But I just think all he does is stay. I uh, wouldn't be at all surprised if Ryan rides him and say prominently, but I don't think he'll be left with a lot to do, shall we say. I think they'll try and pick things up uh, two or three out and really kick on and make this make this a proper test of stamina be the way I'd see it. So, yeah, Clyde for me around 11 to 2 mark to defy the big weight. Clyde 11 to 2 with William Hill and Bet Victor and Coral. Daryl, close us out. What do you reckon? Uh, I, like, I like two in here. Uh, I do like Clyde. The reason... I like this horse is because I like Collide, and that's Vijara Prince who heads the market. I think this could be one of the gambles of the week. Now, he's, he's been off for a long, long time. But his form last year, included in the Duke of Edinburgh, when ahead of Collide on uh, level weights, um, he just screamed that day like he wanted a mile six and a step up and trip. Uh, if he gets a bit of rain, he gets a bit of cut in the ground, he's going to have a fantastic chance. He goes, he's been gone well fresh before, so the absence doesn't concern me too much. Um, he gets seven pounds now off Collide. Um, and he finished th- uh, two le- only a couple of lengths in front front over a shorter trip. But obviously, they're both going to improve for this step up and trip. Uh, off a mark of 99, I think Fujara Prince has got a massive chance here. I think he could be a big gamble on the day and go off shorter than, than five to one. The other is Shailene um, at around 16 to one. This horse had a lovely prep uh, in a group three race on return. Set up lovely for this race. This horse just gives and gives and gives. Always wanted this step up a trip. They tried it once before. He finished behind Kings of Voice at Goodwood. Uh, she finished behind Kings of Voice at Goodwood. Just kept on that day. Went off at 25 to 1 that time. Um, but the jockey and the horse of Eston Souza, they're made for each other. They just keep working hard and keep working hard. And I can see Shailene, if if she's not ridden too far out the back, she'll need a prominent position. I can see her kicking on and uh, perhaps winning off this mark of 103. But I think... Collide, Fujara, Prince and Shailene. I think if you if you back one of those, I think you might have the winner on the day. Um, nothing else looks extremely well handicapped. A lot of exposed horses. You're sort of looking for the horse that is stepping up in trip perhaps or is now running over their best trip. Um, I think there's some nice horses in here. So Shailene, 16 to 1, Labrooks and Bet Victor. And Boyle Sports, Fujara, Prince, that 5 to 1 that Daryl thinks isn't going to last until... We get to the race. That five to one is with Labrooks. And I've already mentioned Collide. That brings us to the end of day two. Before I let you both go to find some winners on day three, just going to ask you for your nap of Wednesday. So your best bet of Wednesday. Daryl, coming to you first. Uh, Berlin Tango in the in the 150 in the Hampton Court. Berlin Tango at six to one. Ed? Uh, Hukum, uh each way in the 225, the King George Stakes. Kikum at 14 to 1. Thank you both very much, Daryl Carter and Ed Quigley, for taking us through so expertly day two of Royal Ascot. Uh, if we haven't got to Tuesday yet, if you're listening to this on either Monday afternoon or on Tuesday morning, there is a Tuesday podcast and video out as well. We're about to record Thursday, Friday and Saturday too. So plenty more to get through, plenty more winners. Make sure that you go to the Odds Checker YouTube channel in order to see the videos. Subscribe to the Odds Checker podcast in order to get the podcasts and download the Odds Checker apps for all the best odds, the best tips, including from, of course, Daryl, but Andy Holding every day during Royal Ascot as well. Plenty more there. So important, such an important tool to have in order to aid your gambling throughout Royal Ascot. But most importantly, bet responsibly and enjoy the racing.